Hi all, welcome back to Spirits of the Fringe and thank you for waiting. It's been a little while since the last one. Uh, apologies for that. I blame that on a combination of uh, trying to keep a baby alive and trying to write a new Edinburgh Fringe show. I would um, not recommend anyone try and combine those two things. It's <laughs> proving quite tricky, but uh, the show will be great. Uh, and thank you for uh, the people that came to my First previews of that at Bath Comedy Festival and uh, Machanrath Comedy Festival as well. Uh, it's it's going to be a show. <laughs> it's, it's a lovely shambles at the moment, but uh, it, it will be a show. And I think you'll agree, the, the, the live band are excellent. I now just have to get my level of goodness up to theirs. So, uh, ages to go. And thank you to those who came to see my shows in the US of A. Much appreciated as uh, Donald Trump makes his makes his uh, imperious visit to our country. I like to think it was a kind of cultural exchange, and they got me uh, in his place. So, uh, yeah, it was lovely. Uh, three weeks, travelling around, doing LA, uh, Wisconsin, and then Chicago. Uh, didn't do any shows in Chicago, but got to visit the incredible Second City uh, for the first time out there, watching some insanely good improv and sketch stuff. And these shows at the Arty Gras Festival in Wisconsin, uh, small but perfectly formed, lovely audiences uh, who I, I genuinely wasn't sure what people were going to make of an aloof Frenchman over there. It's a part of America I've not really visited. It's very American. I was put up in a lovely hotel in Wisconsin Rapids, which that week also housed a steel guitar convention. And on the door of the hotel was a notice saying, please, please don't bring your guns in. So you know, different different culture, isn't it? <laughs> a lot of lot of mullets and uh, cowboy boots that week in that hotel, and we narrowly avoided. I think it was minus twenty the the, the week before, so we, we dodged a very cold bullet there. And I say we. I was travelling around uh, with family in tow with Pauline and little Ronnie the baby, and he was at a lovely age where he was basically rifling through people's bags in customs and on public transport and growling indiscriminately at passers-by and people on buses and uh, uh, somehow that was that was that was deemed cute can get away with such things but yeah it was a a, a fun return to LA I, I hadn't played that place for many years the last time I think I've spoken about this before but the last time I did so I was returning from a lovely tour of New Zealand courtesy of New Zealand Comedy Festival uh, officially the best comedy festival in the world and it was around I think it was 2010 2011 and it was a delightful tour I was I was feeling king of the world and I saw the flight was going back via LA and asked if I could just stop off for a night just to, to check it out. I booked in a gig at the comedy store and I just remember arriving, the guy on the door just looking me up and down and going, you know who's played here, right? <laughs> With also you know, Robin Williams behind him and various other sort of alumni uh, along the wall. And I went, oh, yeah, that's, that's why I chose to spend my one night uh, playing here. And uh, lo and behold, he was, uh, he was right in a way. Uh, the look he gave me, I played to absolute silence <laughs> but the occasional cough. I think I was slow clapped off stage, pretty much. And there is nothing like that in comedy to immediately bring you back down to earth and go, oh yeah, you're as good as the last gig you played. What made it worse, I guess, is is that there were then acts coming up and just doing lazy Mexican material, which was getting. Uh, well, laughs, perhaps not great laugh, belly laughs, but at least laughs, not silence. And I sort of just trudged out of there going, well, I didn't want to entertain you anyway. <laughs> and uh, and I didn't. Although I've since found out that that guy on the door of the comedy store has since been fired from the comedy store, apparently for uh, fiddling the books, I believe. So there you go, karma. So there you go. So it was nice to return to uh, uh, to LA. Did a wonderful gig for for Bronston Jones uh, down at the Village Underground, which is a delightful space uh, where I believe the Doors did some of their early gigs. And it's an old um, uh, it's an old speakeasy. So from real Prohibition era, they still had the uh, the, the kind of old. Uh, fake wardrobe above the stairs and uh, oh, lovely, lovely vibe there. Uh, did a lovely show for Don't Tell Comedy as well, which is a genius concept. I would love to talk to these guys on the podcast at some point, actually. It's where they just stage comedy in unlikely venues and tell people at the last minute and just always get a crowd because, of course, 
everyone wants to be there. And I met them uh, when they came over to the UK and did a, did a show at Madame Two Swords, which was delightful, very bizarre. Stood there amongst all the uh, the, 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 the waxworks, just stood still. Uh, I've, I've had worse audiences, <laughs> LA. But uh, yeah, so that, that was good. And then uh, got to do my solo show for a couple of nights at the Lyric Hyperion, thanks to Dr. Brown. Real name, Phil Burgers, of course, who's doing great things out there. If you get a chance to see his short film The Passage it's on YouTube really worth watching lovely really silly uh, it's great but yeah he got me booked in at the Lyric Hyperion and what a lovely lovely venue that is uh, just sort of across from old Hollywood and uh, had a delightful time there and also at the very same venue a night before got to judge a drag king contest which was hosted by the wonderful Deanna Flacher which brings us on to this podcast what a segue that was uh, Deanna is a wonderfully thoughtful practitioner of immersive comedy best known for her private eye character Buck Kapinski a striking creation with a streetlight protruding from the back of his Mac what originally appears as a literally in your face verbal and physical assault actually reveals itself to be a sweet and all inclusive way of telling a story using the audience as that story's assembled cast it's a show that I would happily go and see again and again to enjoy how those audience members take on their roles. Deanne is currently in the UK to host her Naked Comedy Lab workshops in which she uses clowning techniques to discover playfulness and vulnerability. I took part in one of those in Australia a couple of years ago and absolutely loved it. Here's Deanna talking to me via Skype from Washington, D.C. I'm so sorry about that. Deanna Fleischer, hello. Hello, Alexis. Hi. I've been trying to work out my intro for this, and I'm, I'm, try, I'm trying to sort of figure out how to describe you and what you do. How would you describe yourself? I guess it depends who you ask. I mean, like... <laughs> well, I'm asking you. Uh, you know, I, um, I'm, uh, I'm an interactive comedian that, that, uh, that's actually uh, funny and approachable as opposed to, like, terrifying and bad. Maybe. Um, <laughs> That's nice. I'll go with that. For people who are like more kind of in the know about like, you know, new theater trends, I'm in the clown buffon kind of realm. Um, but for people who are not in that uh, world, you know, I try not to use those terms. Hmm. I'm really torn because on one hand, I think that like clown is like actually a really important word that we need to reclaim because to me it's like the most beautiful kind of comedy maker you can be because you're like sacrificing your own dignity for the purpose <laughs> of making a laugh so like i think that that's enormously important important in the world um but it it, it does have some it does have some misunderstandings around it you know well, you say, um, yeah, we're talking of beauty and approachability. Let's discuss those things. The first time I saw you was in Edinburgh. It was at the Fringe, and you were, I think it was your first year. You were doing Buck Kapinski, which we will, of course, talk about in, in detail. Um, and it was at the Liquid Rooms Warehouse, oh, I believe. Wow. Yeah. So you say approachable. It was one of those venues that is, is in Edinburgh. You kind of look on the map and you go, oh, God, where that is, that could be anywhere. That could be up a hill. That could be under a bridge. That could be, you know, anywhere. It was such a hard-to-find venue. And then once in the venue, you had to then navigate the various stairways and, you know, little nooks and stuff to find the space. So so it felt like a real treat to be, to yeah. be finding your show in the first place. Yes. Yeah. You're not the first person who said to me that, like, the journey to find the show was really part of their experience with it, which is yeah, pretty it, cool. It, it was a physical and emotional journey. Yeah, I mean, like, I feel really lucky that I did Free Fringe. Um, I mean, because, like, you know, I went back in 2017 and did Pleasance, and that was just, like, so cushy and, like, easy mm. compared to Free Fringe. But, like, there's really cool things about Free Fringe, and I think one of them is, like, right, these, like, weird, you know, liquid rooms was, like, a dis it was like a discotheque hmm. that just reeked of like late night debauchery, you know? Oh, yeah. And uh, De was, decades of Scottish drinking you know, and late so, night partying. Yeah. So it was like very gross in there, but like yeah. an interesting place to do my show, you know? 
Well, yours was easily, I think, the most theatrical in that place. I, I think you'd have to say it was kind of, you know, because uh, to describe Buck Kapinski, it's basically the first thing that strikes you is is just the setup of it. There's no stage. You've got chairs everywhere around, so no one really knows where the stage is. And then you appear this incredible uh, the vision of, with the uh, the vaudevillian makeup, the the Mac, and of course the uh, the enormous streetlight protruding from your back and into your face. Yeah. Yeah. And eventually into the faces of everyone in the audience. And um, I, I think it was it was a great one to see because I think because it was free fringe, especially, I think there were a lot of people there not knowing what it was, who had just wandered into something at that time slot because it was free, perhaps. Uh, that's not to put you down. It was, you know, it was the first year and it was, I think, probably the first week. I think I saw you as well because a friend of mine was really like who'd seen you elsewhere. Just going, oh, you've got to see this before it starts selling out kind yeah. of thing. And so uh, it was a really interesting mix because it's so immersive. And I think there are a bunch of people who did not expect it to be that. Did you find that a lot with the free fringe? Yeah. Yeah. I think it was, I think you're right. There was that year, there was more of a, of a mix in the audience, but like I, in general, like I felt, I think that run went really well. I think that was my first run in the UK. And like, I, I think the UK is like my favorite place to do shows so far. Like I feel the most, I feel the most normal Hmm. there. Like I feel the most, like even people walking off the street who have no idea what they're getting are kind of like, all right, all right. You know, yeah. it's like, all right. I, I don't know. It's, it's a little bit more like, I hope that wasn't a Scottish accent, by the way. No, it wasn't. <laughs> I can't, I can't do a Scottish. I could, can't even really do a British accent, but yeah, like I just feel, I don't know. For some reason, I think that my work is like, makes a little bit more sense to British people. Um, well, I think we, we, yeah, we may be seen as being a bit stuffy at times, but I think when it comes to immersive theatre, we can't get enough of it. I think we do get into it. Yeah, and I think that just like, I don't know, mysteries are really baked into like the British consciousness. And I think eccentric comedy is just like really like there's a long tradition of weird comedy there. Uh, yeah, I just I think that, you know. Monty Python came from there. I just think that like, yeah, I just feel like it's, it's more available to weirdness. Um, and I think like in general, like in, there's more of a tradition like in Europe in general, and I'm going to, for, for this purpose of the sentence, classify uh, Britain as part of Europe. Thank um, you. Thank you. I'll try and put, I'll try and put this podcast out in time. Yeah. 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 Thank you. There's, um, <laughs> Yeah, there's just like more of a culture of like going out to shows. Like it's a little bit more normal to to go to a live entertainment experience. Well, I think there's also, I mean, this is probably universal, but we we really love it just from 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 daytime TV and from 80s TV, the trope of the uh the private eye and the yeah. uh, and the film noir and Yeah. So we love a bit of that. Yeah. I mean, where's the most bizarre place you've taken it? I mean, you know, okay, so I say I say like, oh yeah, I'm super at home and, uh, you know, in Britain, but I would say, uh, so last spring I did, um, I did like a little tour of like rural, like, um, village halls hmm. in Devon. Oh, wow. Uh, so it was like all retired, retired people. <laughs> Um, and they had had like a curry dinner as like part of the entertainment. Yeah, so it's like standard. They all arrive and they have like a curry, and then I go out and do a show for them. Like that's that's. Wow. <laughs> so they're, they're they're filled up with curry, and they've now got to be the show. <laughs> yeah, and they're right. you know that's like I think that that was, um, yeah, like those shows were a bit weird. Like those people are like not expecting. Cause not only, right. Cause like, as you said, like, not only am I like a weird little American private detective wearing my own light that then gets moved around and put in audience spaces and, you know, cast audience, but also everything's gender flipped. So I'm casting all the men in the audience as like the beautiful whores and stuff. So it's like mm-hmm. all, it's like old, you know, old, like retired British stuffy men are like, I'm asking them to be like whore, you know, it's just oh, look, like, I think you'll find that they enjoy cross-dressing the most. <laughs> That's a good British tradition. If ever there was one. Yeah. I mean, so it was just like, 
it, I think it's always, I think my show is like pretty down and dirty. And I think that like it, I think the people who it's generally for are probably like a sort of younger, hipper kind of crap. I mean, not necessarily like there's been plenty of old people, older people that I've really connected to, but like, you know, I think doing a show where it's like all older people is definitely, uh, you know, weird. Yeah. But again, really smart concept. You know, it's, it's such a, it's, it's a tradition that goes back so, so long, you know, the, um, uh, what you're trying to convey of, of the, yeah, the, like I say, the private eye character and the, and the, um, the thriller kind of thing. And, um, I, I think, is it, um, do, do, do you ever get audiences where they really, really, where you just have to carry it, where there's, I mean, because you get pretty, you try and get everyone involved, don't you really in the audience? Yeah. Uh, rarely. I've had, you know, I've had a few shows in my, in my career of doing it that were just like, oh, that was brutal. But like, rarely. Um, yeah, surprisingly rarely, considering how much I'm asking of the audience. And was it, did the character come fully formed or was it something that you really, really sort of honed and worked on? Or did you pretty much go, oh, this is it. And you found your, you know, that clown. Yeah. I mean, I was like, I was like studying clown and I was living in New York city and I was like a big film noir fan always. And I wore a trench coat around New York city. Cause that's kind of how I was. And I was super <laughs> to that realm. And I was like on a street once in New York. Um, and I like had my, uh, my, uh, do you have those things in, in, uh, England that like look like cigarettes, but you actually smoke pot in them. What joints? Well, but it's <laughs> no, no, yeah, yeah good. No, it's, like, it's like a, it's like a pipe. Uh, like not, oh, yeah, a little bit. I think it's, I think they've come back in again with vaping and everything. Yeah, you see, yeah, I've seen people with them. Yeah. So those were bi- that was big in my life, like back in New York when like weed was definitely not legal and. Yeah. It was- Yeah. And I was big into it back then. And I like had a hit of weed and then I just went, it was a dark street. Oh, I've got it. Like, (laughs) and, and I never, like, I don't, I don't perform high. I don't recommend that. But like in terms of like finding an idea sometimes, (laughs) sometimes um, just one little drag, just one drag. And I was like, Oh, there it is. And I, (laughs) And I knew, I like knew, cause like I used to speak that way when I was a kid. Like when I was a kid, I had all oh, these. Really? Things. Yeah. And, uh, so that's like, kind of like, it's my, you know, it, it's my first language. Oh, speak that's great. All the speaking, it comes very naturally to my mouth. But, um, but of course you'd, but you'd have had training to kind of erode that, I guess. Yeah. Yeah. I had years of <laughs> the irony. But, but I think that like, that was still sort of like when people in my family wanted to like say something in a funny voice, Hmm. that was the voice everybody used, (laughs) even though I grew out of it. Like I really, that was part of the sort of family comedy canon. And so, yeah, I think that it just like came so naturally to me. And I was so sure when I found it, that it was something and I took it to whatever clown class I was in at the time. And I was like, I think I've got something. And I did it. And then I would remember the teacher and he was just kind of like leaning forward and he had his hand on his chin and he just goes, I don't think it's clown. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm lucky that I like, I was so sure that it was good that I, it didn't affect me, you know? It's lovely. It's a gift that keeps on giving in the show. You think it's going to tie, you think it won't be fun anymore. And then there's some word or phrase that you'll come out with or phrase rather, um, that will just set people off again. It's, it's glorious. Oh yeah. oh yeah. Yeah. It's, it's like such an amazing improv tool because I improv. surprise myself with what comes out of my mouth. Um, it's like, so, so you're sort of reclaiming it for your childhood self. You're kind absolutely. Of, <laughs> that's it's great. Empowering. Yeah. Yeah. And of course, you um, uh, try and instill this in other people as well. I, I mean, there's I've, I've done your workshop, which is fantastic, Naked Comedy Workshop, which will uh, Naked Comedy Lab, which we'll come on to a bit. But um, I want to talk just briefly about this as well, like because the last time I saw you was out in LA and uh, doing, uh, and it was an honour to be a part of uh, being a judge for the uh, for the Drag King yeah. contest. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. It yeah. was awesome i didn't i had no idea i just arrived in town i said of course yeah i'll do it yeah it sounds great and i had no idea with with those women it was the first time they'd done anything like that 
I didn't realize that you had been workshopping with them. And it was, oh, it was amazing just seeing these women just come out and be the grossest men they could be the crotch grabbing, the mansplaining, the, all of that. Yeah. I was really happy with that. I mean, it's a new workshop for me and it comes, it comes from a place of feeling like for whatever reason, being a man or, tr- or being like some version of a man on stage has been like a real key for me to find like a deeper, more successful level of funny. Mm. And I, that I was like really knocking my head against comedy walls for years and years and years as a woman. And then hmm. as, soon as I'm kind of a shitty man, like suddenly something happens. And so I was really interested in like, I'm still like super interested in like, how can I, um, how can I, ins- how can I guide other people into that and into finding that? Um, so yeah, it's a new workshop. I'm very excited about it. And I'm still kind of like, figuring out what the, I want it to be. Um, I think that it's for people who were at least born, uh, assigned female, you know? Mm. Uh, but I think that in today's sort of like gender complicated gender politics world, I think it's like, it's just interesting. Like, um, I think it, I got none of that pushback in LA in terms of like, there was no problem in LA with like offering a class for women. Um, but I think that, uh, I think that I, I'm still trying to figure out what's the language so that I get the right people. And, um, yeah. So, and I mean, that'd be interesting having, having people who've transitioned sort of doing the, the, doing that, doing the, the drag King thing. That'd be a fascinating element to add to it. Yeah, maybe. I'm like still trying to figure that out, you know, because I think that like people who have fully transitioned to be men don't need like that's not they probably don't need it, you know, Mm. like they've accessed whatever their mess. They've probably I mean, you know, who knows? I can't speak for, you know, I don't I I can't speak for anybody, Um, but might also gain some lovely insight, (laughs) you know, to use on stage and just to sure in that world. Yeah. Absolutely. Because the, I mean, the variety was was just fantastic that night. There was, uh, you know, you had the, the real kind of redneck douchebag. You had the, uh, the the winner, in fact, still that's still haunts me to this day. Like her her act of just that that horrible asymmetrical bowl cut. The, what was the name of the character? Um. Oh God, what was his name? Was it? it was such a great name as well. But just had this thousand yard stare and like just absolutely you know terrifying persona could snap at any minute could uh, definitely borderline psychopath and it was so watchable oh so watchable like definitely like you know definitely on like what did he say he was um something celibate what's the word when you're yeah. in oh in cell wasn't it in, in cell. cell involuntary celibate <laughs> oh so creepy <laughs> so creepy so creepy um yeah it's uh it was a great, it was a great thing. And like, I was definitely relying on, like, there's a lot of talent in LA, you know, and a lot of hunger, but yeah, like those women turned it out. Yeah. And, and, and I suppose it did a lot of them find it quite cathartic. Would you say at the end as well? It seemed that way, right? Like, yeah, definitely. Yeah. Cause naked comedy lab as well. So it's, it's sort of an extension of that, I guess, isn't it? It's the, the workshops that you do, uh, which kind of which is so much fun to do dealing with, I guess, vulnerability and pathos, uh, in clowning. Yeah. His name was Thad. That's it. Thad. Thad. <laughs> <laughs> well remembered. Yeah. Uh, Thad. Uh, yeah. On my Instagram, there's a, there's a picture of him with his trophy. <laughs> Great. <laughs> I, will link, I will link to that because people need to see that and oh, yeah, it's link a good to one. Their dreams as well. Yeah. I mean, my, my workshops are about, yeah, they're about vulnerability and, uh, and like what is each kind of performer's unique unspoken conversation with the audience that's happening all the time, you know? Cause I have found that like my, like my language as a performer can set the audience at ease in a certain way, but I think that it's, more my nonverbal cues, um, that really gives them permission and like make them feel safe, you know? So uh, any examples of that? Yeah. I mean, I think that like, I'm a very verbal 
person. Mm. Um, so even though I don't, I may not say it out loud. Like if the audience doesn't laugh at something I do, I put the text in my brain. I forgive you and I love you anyway. Hmm. Um, and I give that like tiny bit of space to like get those words through my subconscious. Um, because I think that like cueing the audience that it's not their fault if they don't love me in that moment will set them up to love me again very soon. Oh, you know? brilliant. And you, yeah. you found that is, that's, that's a successful method, is it? Absolutely. And I think it also just makes, it makes me as a performer feel better to like flip that paradigm you know, I think a lot of us get into performance work, like kind of thinking of ourselves as like the child, you know, and the audience is like the parent, you know, that can like stamp mm. judgment or not. And I'm just right. super interested in like, how do we flip that paradigm so that, you know, we think of the audience as the child that needs the nurturing and the reassuring and the caretaking. And we are the parent, you know, who are there to make them feel safe and to make them feel loved and to make yeah. them it's all going to be okay. That's great because I yeah I come from a more of a stand up background where and I've been guilty of this as well where often if an audience isn't going for someone's stuff the the performer can turn petulant can turn you know, defensive and 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 you know and kind of blame uh, the audience you know maybe maybe sometimes the room isn't set up right maybe whatever but you know we're, we're all in that same space and if an audience isn't laughing well there you go that's you're you're kind of failing at your job yeah. And it's, uh, it's quite, you know, I, I've done it myself as well, where I've, I've just, especially in character, but then, uh, you know, sometimes <laughs> you use that. Well, I feel myself <laughs> slipping out. I think you have a really interesting mix, like as Marcel LeCant, like you, you quote unquote hate the audience yeah. and like are super yeah. insulting to us. But like, I feel like you love us so much. Like you're sure. non, you're non, like you say that you think we're all shit, but I feel like you're nonverbal love for us is so obvious yeah there has to be that um uh, sort of the, the the unseen wink doesn't there yeah the, 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 that's going on and that and i think we have to know like that you mm. the performer are like fine if we don't love everything you're doing like that you the performer are like you're you are going to be okay like you are not going to be destroyed if we don't like something you're doing for five seconds or mm. whatever you know that there's just a baseline like um, or even he, that there's there's fun to be had with them not laughing. There's there's, yeah. fun, there's fun to be had in my annoyance at their yeah. <laughs> they're not getting it or not laughing. Yeah, I was just reading this great article about. Uh, do you like Tracy Morgan? Mm, yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm a huge Tracy Morgan fan. Like Tracy Morgan to me is like a deep clown of our era. And yeah. he, I don't know like, much of his stuff, but I, I yeah, I should look into him more. Yeah, have, have you seen Thirty Rock? Yes. Yeah. So it's like, I think that's like, that's some of his best work. Yeah. Is like that character on 30 rock, but, yeah, it's lovely. um, but he's like in the article, he's like, he's like, I'm going to tell you how to act. Like I know all about acting. Like the key, all you have to do to be a great actor, relax your soul. <laughs> and I'm like, that's it, man. <laughs> that's beautiful. Yeah. That, that, that yeah. really easy notion. Yeah. <laughs> like, right. Exactly. Not like it's easy, but I think that like, <laughs> That to me is like the key to, to being a good clown is just yeah. like your soul is it chill. Is. Your soul is okay. You know? Well, yeah, it was always because I, I, I did a brief bit of clowning and it was always it was the feeling your clown around you, you know, is is and, and that, that's kind of what it is, really. It's, it's being relaxed in your soul. It's kind of going, ah, breathing out and kind of yeah. going, yeah, great. This is this is what's going on. This is what's happening. Because yeah. yeah. um, I, I was this is why it's so interesting for me doing doing a workshop, because I'm obviously very verbal, but quite literally, it's not me kind of you know, being verbal in my head. I'm a I'm a writer. I'm a writer. And then so, and, that, and that sort of leads everything is what I suppose what Gaulier would call. Uh, uh, intellectual wanker, you know, someone that's oh, sort of yes. overly wordy, overly thinky, that sort of thing. But that's because, you know, it's from a stand up background, so it's kind of how I deal with it. But to bring the vulnerability uh, into, uh, you know, in, into into my performances, that's that was something really important. That's something that, that obviously I don't really do as Marcel. It's that that superior, absolute highest superiority, you know, is what is what I deal with. So so to do something. A nonverbal and B just vulnerable was was felt like a really good workout for my comedy. Yeah, yeah, it's a great. I think that it's such a good. Yeah, it's like so applicable to stand ups because I think that like stand ups think 
I think good standups, like maybe like you, like you think it's about your words, but like, it's not, you know, Mm. like I love your words. Like I love, you have great words, but like, it's the reason I love your work doesn't really have anything to do with your work. (laughs) You know, I, when I think about you, like, you know, I have, you know, I have this calendar of yours up in my (laughs) And I had to redo all the dates because you did the calendar for this year. And I will redo all the dates next year as well. Come out and writing the new dates in. And it's like, you know, there's a few words in there. There's just Marcel Lucant sure. on various chaises. Chaise longs. The 12 chaises of grey calendar. It's so good. Stupid. It's just so, and you're so fucking sure of yourself. And you look so fucking dumb. And it's just like, that's it. You know? Uh, thank you. I'll take that yeah. as a high compliment. Because um, yeah. I was chatting to John Luke Roberts on, on this podcast, and, and he uh, said something really interesting that actually something he's learned over the years is that what you say is actually perhaps the least important thing of a performance. Yeah. So yeah, there we go. It's um, yeah, I've sort of come to realise that a little bit as well. I think I think with Marcel, it always it was the attitude that came first. Obviously, yeah, exactly. No, yeah. Started writing, but there's something really interesting from the workshop as well i hope this isn't kind of giving away a trade secret maybe you want to keep this to to the workshop but it was just the whole um preparation before going on stage that really interesting thing where you sort of make yourself fall backwards but then catch yourself before you do to give you that jolt uh to go on and perform yeah it's brilliant i still do that i think i've I've caught people have caught me doing it (laughs) it's a great it's a great little trick like Mm -hmm. i I love that. Just that creating that sensation of, I think it's about, it's really about like finding balance. Well, it's not body. just a balance thing. It's making you feel a bit alive as well. It's like, Ooh, hello. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> that's, it's that, you know, that dream that you wake up from where you're falling. It's, you know. Yeah. 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 But that's a great, it's such a nice reminder that like the audience likes to see you precarious, you know? Mm. No, that, that, I definitely, uh, that was a really lovely little thing that I took away from, from the workshop. And it was a lovely way of, to, to start it as well, of, of kind of everyone just having a little, you could see everyone having the little vulnerable moment. That, yeah, yeah. Really nice. Beautiful. Yeah. So with the, with the, with the workshops, you, uh, you deal with um, kind of immersion as well, getting, getting people to be uh, uh, immersive and kind of get, getting people to kind of interact with everyone else. And there's... Um, there's been a lot of talk at the moment with immersive comedy about where the line is, about where it's, you know, there, there, there've been a few incidents uh, in festivals around where uh, audience members feel that the performer's gone too far. They've invaded their personal space or they've got yep. messy. Where would you sort of draw the line on this? Well, I think it's about, it's about getting permission. Like, and I think that it doesn't necessarily mean, and this is also where the nonverbal stuff comes in. Like if you're paying really close attention when I like, I think that like, I think that audience interaction problems happen when a performer is not paying close enough attention to Mm -hmm. what the audience is giving them because audience members are non verbally screaming whether they're giving you permission or not. Like all you have to do is listen, like their non verbal cues are so loud. Um, and I think that it's about like, how do we tune in to what an audience member is giving us. And like, how do we like, you know, I don't ask audience members. Like, I mean, I, if I'm going to make out with an audience member, I do usually, I usually ask unless <laughs> it's like extremely clear that they're completely up for it. Like, mm. you know, like I, if I'm unsure, if I might, if, if I might get them to make out with me, I ask, but if they're like good to go, then we just hit it. But it's like, um, you know, audience members are very clear and like, you can, you can, you give them, you know, you give them a little opening and you see what they do. And if they respond back to you, then you can go a little further, you know, but it's like, um, and maybe once you've established a little bit of trust between you and that audience member, you could go a lot further because there's obviously like a lot of comedy in taking a big risk, Mm. but you can't take that big risk until you've already received some degree of consent. Like, it's just like, what are you doing? You know? Yeah. So I think that like, and I, and I also think like, I think that some of this kind of falls along gender lines. Like I think that, uh, I think it's easier for, um, I think it's easier for women 
and or non men um, to get farther in terms of audience interaction because do you think it's doubly so with you being addressed as a man as well no i mean like no one knows that i i mean no one believes for one second that i'm a man like everyone knows that i'm a woman so i think (laughs) that i don't think that that matters but i think that like when i watch other shows or when i think about it like i just think that like it's harder for men to get away with the same stuff that that non-men can get away with just because it's like, if you're a man and you're going out into the audience, like sitting on someone's lap without really asking or kissing them without really asking or like making sexual references without really asking, like that's just the fucking patriarchy. Like, like we just deal with that all the time. Like, it's just not funny. Just like, right. Yeah. It's not subversive. It's not. Yeah. Subversive. Right. So it's, I think that it's a lot more subversive when non-men do that. Um, but I think that there's like, yeah, like you've got to listen, you know? And I I think there's no excuse for performers who aren't, who aren't listening to those nonverbal cues. Like it, it really, it gives the rest of us a bad name. Yeah. So you're, are you, when you're going around for that first time and you're kind of shining the light in people's faces, are you kind of making little judgments on each person and they're going, oh, I think this, I think this one will play. I don't think this one will. Yeah. I mean, I'm doing that before the show too. Like I'm out, I'm out during the show, like, but I'm out before the show starts when people are coming in pretending to clean. Like I'm like doing yeah. custodial work, like in the corner <laughs> and already yeah. checking people out. Um, <laughs> And, you know, you don't know, like you don't necessarily know based on what people are giving you pre-show or even, you know, when I'm, yeah, like definitely you're right. Like when I'm walking around in the early part of my show, looking at people, like I'm, I'm definitely picking, like I'm, I'm, I'm like, who's going to give me stuff. Who's not going to give me stuff. Like, yeah, I am, I am making some initial predictions, but I'm, I'm wrong sometimes, you Mm. know? Um, or I'm not usually wrong. Like the people who are, who are exuding a ton of like energy and enthusiasm. Like I know that those people are good to go, Mm. but like some of the people that I'm really interested in are the people who aren't giving me that, but might, might be willing to play in a way that's like risky for them. Um, and those people you don't know, like sometimes they're kind of stone faced and then you give them something hmm. and they go a hundred percent. And you're just like, this was a humongous win. But like, you have to, you have to give them lit, like you have to give them something little before you give them something big or you have to like, mm. you know, it's, uh, I, it, it's just like the audience is, the audience is so, the audience is so attentive to how you treat their own. So if they can see that you're being, careful that you're being kind that you're picking people for things that they want to do their amount of like group consent goes up exponentially like if they see you you know if they see you being good at audience interaction you're going to get more you're going to be able to get more out of them it's funny isn't it despite being a bunch of strangers you are still the stranger that's come into their midst right that's right yeah they are united potentially against you if you're not like really. And I mean, that's why I think that also like audience participation has to be kind of incremental. Like you got to start like the, if, if you're doing a lot of it, then the first thing that you give has to be something like really easy and fun. And you have to give it to, to a person or a group of people who like already look like they want to do it, you know? Mm. So it's like, you have to, I mean, there's, there's ways of building things into your show that, can really set you up for success in that stuff. But like, you just got to really think about it. You know, is that the biggest buzz for you? Do you think turning someone, you know, to, to who you think isn't going to play? Yeah. I mean, yeah. Or not even just people who are, yeah, I guess that is the biggest buzz. Like people (laughs) people who present like, like they're not already like having a blast drunk with their friends, like people, you know, like, like the, the older gentleman who's just there by himself, you know, mm. and ends up making out with me <laughs> and being a beautiful whore. Like that's pretty good, you know? <laughs> um, yeah. Or like, yeah, just like the woman, you know, the, 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 the quiet woman in the corner who ends up doing this crazy confession or just, yeah, yeah. I think that is a real, that is a real high for me. Are there any sort of standout surprises from any festivals that you can remember? I mean, I, yeah, I, uh, no, I wouldn't say like, I, I think that I've, I've just had those. I think that I guess what I just, those examples I just said, like, I couldn't give you like a specific one, mm. but 
definitely I've had like beautiful moments with strangers where I felt like we were doing something that was like risky for them, something that they would not normally do, but something that they were like enormously satisfied by and happy about and something that like made them feel like cool and brave and successful, you know? And there must've been times in the early days where you perhaps weren't so good at reading the nonverbal cues. Were Were there any moments where you sort of thought, Oh God, okay. I've, I've overstepped the line here. Yeah. But I mean, like I, I think my best training for this work, I used to be a high school English teacher. Mm. Um, and I think that I got very good at reading nonverbal cues from my students in terms of like, when do they know the answer to this question? When have they not done the reading? When, you know, it's just like students are kind of telling you all, I think the kids are like very good at telling you all the time, like nonverbally, like what's going on for them. And so I think that I got good at like, reading the room that way. Um, I think I've had moments. Sure. I mean, yeah, I've totally had moments where I'm like, I pick someone for something and it's like, no, that wasn't the right, that wasn't the right person or whatever. But it's like, yeah, you, you, you You move on, you forgive them, you give them love, you know, you let them know that they're safe and you move on, you know? That's interesting. So I guess that's where the uh, the parent and child relationship you're talking about earlier between you and the audience. I guess that's kind of where that comes from. Is it from the from the teaching? Totally. And so, yeah, you you must get quite a few returning audience members as well because you know then they know they're never going to see the same show again. That must be quite quite good to see. It's incredible. I'm like always like, wait, you've seen the show how many times? Like <laughs> what? Like I can't because it's like because there's plenty of things about the show that do repeat. You know. Mm. Like I used to really be, there was a period like in the first few years where I was really beating myself up about that. And I was like, it should be completely improvised every time. And then it's like, like, no, like there is, you know, there are jokes that, that, you know, are funny and there are bits that, you know, work. And it's like, why would you deny audiences that just because you want to call it improv? Like (laughs) enough of the show is enough (laughs) that was improvised. You know, and also it must be quite fun for someone who has seen it before uh, to know which bit of the story is coming next and to see who's playing those roles and going, oh, great. I can't wait to see this. I think so. Yeah. Like, I think, you know, I, I think that people who have been back to the show, like they like bringing new people, you know, and watching like some friend of theirs have a reaction or some partner of theirs. Like, that's something that I think people have said to me, like, oh, I brought my boyfriend this time or whatever, you know. Yeah, it's great. And I think you probably get quite a few performers in as well, I'd imagine. I think there were quite a few when I saw it. And it's it's a real performer's piece because it's kind of for people who aren't maybe au fait with improv themselves. It's it's They look and go, oh, God, that's terrifying. And for those who sort of know a bit about it, it's just it's so expertly done. And it's so beautifully done. It's just a lovely thing to see. Thank you. Yeah. But you've, I've, I've looked at your list of awards and there's some really interesting ones there. I've never done Orlando Fringe, but just looking at the awards that you've won from there, I want to. You've won the, in the same year, you won the Fringe Crush Award and the Low yeah. Tech Award. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> That's two uh, great awards. And the yeah, Audience Favourite Award as well. I know Fringe is like a great, like, it's shocking because, okay. like, mostly Fringe festivals in the US suck. Like, <laughs> the there's really good festivals in Canada. So I've heard, um, yeah. You haven't done any Canadian tour? Not yet. So I really want to. I really want to. You really should because yeah. Canadians are crazy for British people. Yeah. I'd love to. Uh, what, about, what, about, what about British people pretending to be French? That might be a different matter in Canada. I think it'd still be okay. Like, they just <laughs> love act. Well, yeah. They, they, <laughs> if see. you could put, put a part in the show where you do a British, where you do Marcel Lacan doing a British accent, and then you'll do fine. I um, sort of did one year. There was, there was a bit where I, I play, it was Marcel playing an English character. Yeah. <laughs> doing a little character piece in the middle. So. I'll yeah. It's a, uh, yeah. So, but anyway, so the Canadian fringe circuit is like fantastic. And like, it's just like, so you go from like the English or Australian fringes to the Canadian fringes. And you're just like, you just can't even believe. Right. Like how nice they are. <laughs> yeah. Know? Properly fringy by the sounds of it as well. Fringy. And also just like, so like audience members are like, Oh, you've got a flyer. You know what I mean? Oh like, my God. Oh, I miss those days. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, but the, but, but so, but, but in the U S like it's general fringe festivals are generally crap except Orlando. Um, is this incredible fringe and like, uh, you know, it's, it's, 
it's probably like 30 years old. Like it's, I, I don't know exactly how old it is, but it's been running for a while and it just has this like huge base and it's just like people freaking go to it. And, right. uh, so yeah, it was a great, that was a super fun festival to me. And it's a really interesting, I think the audiences are really interesting cause it's Orlando, Florida. So it's like, it's Florida. So yeah. there's definitely some like Floridianness, but also there's like a lot of like, you know, there's a big queer scene there and a lot of people like working for Disney or whatever. So, I mean, it's just like a really interesting mix of like very sort of like out there, interesting, fringy stuff and kind of like more slightly more buttoned up theater goers who are just kind of excited to experience the weirdness. Um, right. But yeah, it was, um, yeah, that was a great little festival for me. And have you seen anything on your travels that's kind of really opened your mind as well? I think the stuff that really turns me on nowadays is much more like immersive, interactive, small scale stuff. Um, that's the stuff that like really blows my mind, like where it's just like one audience member at a time or a couple of audience mm. members and we're being led through something or we're in some kind of interesting space or like, um, you know, I love like I love escape rooms and I love like when escape room stuff is kind of more blended with, with theater. Like I think mm. that that's kind of like, that's where my work is going. Like that's kind of what I'm really interested in more and more. Um, you yeah. must know, have, have you heard of you, me, bum, bum train? No. Oh, look this up. This is, it's incredible. They, uh, it's, it's basically tickets are, are just absolute gold dust. It's something they do, they do in Britain and in, in London. And it's, um, uh, yeah, it's completely, it's, one it's your wheeled around i've never done it uh, on either side but i would i would love to at some point um but the audience member is basically wheeled around carted around <laughs> from place to place and it could be the scenario could be anything they could sort of, they're blindfolded i think and then the blindfold is lifted off and they could be suddenly part of a game show or they could be in some you know medieval realm they could be it could be anything uh, uh, going on and they get they enroll celebrities to do it now as well so you're suddenly the blindfolds off and you're there part of a game show with Stephen Fry that kind of thing oh my god it's it'll blow you my yeah you me bum bum train it's, yeah I just looked it up it's not happening right now oh what a shame but it's when it does it's it's yeah like an absolute golden ticket yeah yeah I mean that's the kind of shit that I'm just like fucking that you know yeah um but, and a great name as well. <laughs> yeah, it's a great name. <laughs> so, uh, what's what's the deal next then for you? Are you, are you? Are you doing more? But is but still continuing to traverse the the globe? I mean, but is like you know. So I'm coming. I'm coming over to England in a couple of weeks, um, and I'm doing shows and workshops in London and Bristol and Liverpool. Right. Um, and, uh, that's going to be really fun. I'm excited to do that. And, um, after that I'm coming back here cause I'm starting like, um, I'm starting a, like a workshop retreat near me up here in Washington state. Um, there's like a beautiful kind of artist retreat center, uh, in the mountains oh, nice. about nine miles South of the town I live in. That's like got a sprung floor dance studio and it's got a private lake and it's got a sauna and it's got places for camping and oh, you know, nice. Great. food and everything. And so I'm doing, I'm, I'm running workshops there and I'm, this is my, Why wouldn't first, you? yeah, it's my first year doing it. I'm super excited and people are coming from all over and, um, that's kind of, I really want to like keep doing that. Um, cause I just, I, uh, I think training people is like increasingly important. I mean, it's always been super important to me, but I think that like, I'm more excited to have people come and train than I am to like go off on these big tours. Okay. So you're sort of, uh, you're, you're, I was about to say you're being altruistic. You're kind of, uh, giving people the chance to do, to go and do this themselves. I, I say that, but you know, it sounds like you've also got an idyllic, uh, mini break out of it as well. Yeah. I mean, no, I don't think it's altruism. Like I think that like being a self producing solo touring artist is just like, you know, I've done it for like, I guess five years pretty full on and it's yeah. just like just not where I want to like focus my life you know it's um uh it's it's hard that's something I'm like struggling with a little bit because like I would love yeah I would love so, something to just come out of the ether and like allow me to do Bud Kapinski 
and not have to worry about ticket sales or not have to worry about carrying my own mm. giant golf bag, you know, or just like not <laughs> carrying stuff. a street lamp around with you. <laughs> yeah, it's fucking and it's all in a huge golf bag. It's heavy, <laughs> you know, it's like it's a um, great prop, but holy yeah, shit, yeah. Great, but it's just like, you know, uh, it's a lot for one person. Yeah. And you know, other people maybe could other people could do it or would be into it. But I think that for me, like, um, you know, I'm not going to stop doing the show, but I think that in terms of like actively trying to like book these huge tours for myself, probably less and less, you know? Yeah, that's fair. I think you've done your time. And have you seen people uh, coming out of these workshops that have get, then gone on to produce their own uh, pieces that, that, you know, I, I guess that must be quite rewarding to see that. Absolutely. I mean, I also like direct and dramaturg for people. So I like help people build shows you know, pretty often. Um, and that is super rewarding to like help people create their own material. So let's do, do, do get the shameless plug out of the way. I think we, we, we can we'll start wrapping up quite soon. But when, when are the workshops in London, June 1st and 2nd, uh, at theater Delhi in Bristol, June 7th and 8th, or is it 7th, 8th and 9th? I think it's 7th, 8th and 9th in Bristol. And then in Liverpool, it's, uh, a I think it's either 11th and 12th or 12th and 13th. It's part of the Liverpool Physical Fest. And who do you recommend this workshop for? What, what, what can people expect to get out of it? Um, I think it's for... I think it's for stand-ups. I think it's for clowns. I think it's for buffons. I think it's for actors. I think it's for spoken word people. I think it's for anybody who wants to be... Who wants to feel way more comfortable in front of others and way funnier and way fiercer. Um, you know, and, and have that, like whatever that magic formula is of like feeling totally vulnerable and also completely loved by the audience. Yeah. There is something quite magical about it. You got things out of me that I genuinely didn't expect to come out of me. And it was nice. uh, <laughs> some weird little creatures and stuff. And anyway, it was, it was great. Yeah. So it stayed with me. Yeah. Good. But yeah. there you go. But he. But I will let you uh, get back to your to your day as it as it turns into evening here in London. And um, uh, thank you very much. I, yeah, I'm looking forward to catching up when you're in good old London town. Yeah, it'd be great to see you. Oh, lots of love. Thank you very lots much. Of love, time. Alexis. Talk to you later. Bye. <laughs> see ya. Deanna Fleischer there. Catch her while you can. And I say that knowing full well that this podcast is going out too late to catch her for the London show and the London workshop. Sorry, Deanna. But if you are listening to this in time, uh, people of Bristol and Liverpool, you can catch Buck Kapinski June the 6th at the Wardrobe in Bristol. And then 7th to 9th is the Naked Comedy Workshop. And then Buck Kapinski is on Liverpool for the Physical Theatre Fest uh, 11th and 13th of June. And on 12th and 13th is the workshop. So... Uh, Deanna is now in town, and I believe we're off tonight to see Johnny Woo's Brexit Cabaret at Soho Theatre, which I'm very excited about, hoping that he won't be upstaged by um, Suze Kempner, who's playing multiple roles, I think, in that show, who uh, has recently went viral for her uh, recollection of her time in Iron Appa as a Christina Aguilera tribute act. And if you've not read that on Twitter, it is well worth a read. It just gives and gives and gives. So thank you for listening and thank you to the people who've come up to me in person and said that they listen. That's lovely. So uh, to uh, Mike and Karina from Machunkleth Comedy Festival, which is also an excellent comedy festival on a par with New Zealand. Beautiful festival. Thank you for coming up and saying that you listen. That's that's, uh, that's always nice. That's lovely. And also to Micah, Mika, Mika or Micah, who emailed saying that they went to see Lucy Hopkins doing Secret Circle in Brighton. And apparently, despite drunkenness of other people... Uh, enjoyed it very much and went to it because of this podcast so again that is a lovely thing to hear any questions you have anything you want to say or any suggestions of guests as usual spirits of the fringe at gmail.com no idea who i've got on next time but i promise you it'll be someone fun speak to you then mm-hmm.